Hello, my name is Caroline Foster. I'm a consultant in adolescent infectious diseases based in London. And I really hope you enjoyed the film Life Growing Up. I've got a wonderful panel of young people who are now going to introduce themselves, who are going to talk through some of the themes in the film and reflect on what it means for them and the young per people that they work with. Sasha. Hi, I'm Sasha. I will be on the panel today to discuss living with HIV and growing up with HIV. Um, and I was born with HIV 32 years ago and would like to talk relating to the film Life Growing Up um, and my experiences and the relation with the video. Fletcher. Hello everyone, I'm Fletcher Chu and I'm from Taiwan and I'm young people living with HIV and I, um, I test positive three years ago in 2017. And from that on, I started work with an HIV organization in Taiwan, as well as an regional organization in the Asia Pacific region called Youth Lead. So we focus on young key populations. So I'm happy to be here, uh, join this panel today. And Joyce? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Joyce from AYPIN which is association of um, young people living in HIV and AIDS in Nigeria. I am, I'm going to be on this youth panel talking about how the video has relations to my welfare living with HIV. Lovely. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, I think I was struck at the beginning of the movie um, particularly when young people were talking about found, finding out about their diagnosis and the impact that had on their relationships um, with their families, particularly in the communication. I wonder, um, Sasha, um, what you felt about that part? I, I felt that it related really, really well when I was listening to the movie and the way they wrapped it out. There was a lot of similarities in how I found out um, as I was sick as a child and didn't actually find out until I was 18, at uh, 16, sorry. Um, and I found out by accident. And when I tried to speak to my mum, she just would not talk about it. Nobody would. And, and I found that really, really challenging because when I was 16, I didn't know a lot about it. I just knew about the AIDS and that it can kill you and, it was really troubled time for me and I needed somebody to talk to, but there wasn't anybody to talk to because nobody could. And I think for me saying about, you know, your mum doesn't talk, my mum didn't talk about it. And back then I couldn't understand why, whereas now I look back and I can see, you know, her self stigma, her shame, her own, her own disappointment in herself and how much guilt she must have lived with. But as a child, you need, even as a young teenager, you need that, reassurance that you know and I think for my mum maybe it may be that she needed support she needed support herself to come to terms with her diagnosis and she may have needed mental health help because she'd been living with this knowing this since I was a small child um, and maybe that that's probably what would put the barriers in place and it's the barriers that we needed to to break um, and make it easier for families to be able to discuss this with their children today, because this is still going on today. Um, there is families that do talk about it openly, but they're very far and few between. Um, um, in my experiences, working with young people, talking to parents about HIV, it does not happen. And that video really does shine upon that. And Joyce, is that your experience in your setting? <laughs> Well, yeah, um, watching the short film has actually, um, it's, it's more like it's talking about me in person. Um, I um, started taking drugs right from birth. I got it through my mom. And ever since I've, I've been on drugs, I really didn't know the reason why I was 
getting pills every day. I kept missing school lectures, school classes, or days of my appointments. And I got asked in school why I keep leaving school or why I keep missing school. And I asked at home and all they could say was, you have to back classes. And when I went back, to tell my principal because um, my principal that time happened to be um, a basic science teacher. So um, I had to miss her class where we're supposed to have a test, I think, that day. So um, when I went to take permission, she was um, asking questions. So I told her, they said I have to back off this way. I'm going to the clinic for a checkup. And she was like, she looked at me and she was like, oh, you have to back classes and you don't have any symptoms of coughing or any sort. So I was like puzzled. I didn't know what to say. She was like, you better go home and ask what exactly is wrong with me. And um, I happened to meet um, a doctor from the Institute of Human Biology of Nigeria who um, was in my facility for a research. And while I was there to assess my drugs as usual, she, um, she broke it to me without knowing that I wasn't disclosed to. She, she felt I must have known. So it was an accidental disclosure. And um, I broke into tears because at, at the point before she could even say it, the um, broccoli she was holding was having um, pictures of the drugs I was taking and stuff like that. So already I have already started getting hints that, okay, probably I am HIV positive because these things are similar to what I have. And I started crying and then she, she had to call my aunt and ask. And I aunt told her that um, they were not able to tell me because I lost my both parents when I was seven. So um, growing up, I've been living with my mom's sister. So um, she told her that she wasn't able to disclose to me. So um, she calmed me down and talked to me. And at some point, I got to understand. I started researching about everything. And with the um, association which I work with, it has helped me a lot greatly. Thank, thank you both very much for sharing. Fletcher, do you want to share some of your experience? Yeah, sure. So while I am um, watching the video Life Growing Up, um, although I'm not uh, born with HIV, I actually uh, got my diagnosis when I was like the last year in my university. So it was um, like I got diagnosis accidentally as well. So I went for the clinic because of the, uh, for uh, treatment for other STI, but they also tasted uh, for my HIV um, testing. So when I go back to the clinic, they uh, give me the final result that they tell me uh, you're HIV positive and we will report this back to the government. And we will, because you ha- if you're already 20, so we don't have to let your parents know. And after the um, after the clinic time, you will be uh, taken by a nurse, and she will explain how about the treatment right now, and maybe can also solve some of the concern that you have at the moment. So at that time, actually, so in the education I have in my life, I barely know what HIV is. So I, I kind of know from the media or um, like um, uh, internet. And internet that this could be a deadly disease for me at the moment. I know there's available out there. But when I was taken by the nurse to another counseling room, that nurse actually let me know that uh, so uh, we have a one pure day treatment for uh, people living with HIV in Taiwan now. So she told me that uh, you don't have to start the treatment. Uh, right now because uh, you have to be prepared so you can let me know what's your concern at the moment and if she have the answer to that she will give me the answer but if she don't she will try to figure it out and let me know later so I think that's very um, 
important starting point for me to have someone that actually f- make me feel not anxious about、uh, finding out my、uh, diagnosis, and so it actually take me、um, half year, like six months, to really decide I want to start my treatment because at that time I was、um, graduate from my university and I was thinking maybe should I go abroad for studying. But if I go about for studying, then I I didn't know should I start treatment immediately or maybe later. But after that, I have um consideration that maybe I should I shouldn't go out, so I stay in Taiwan and I start the treatment six years um six months later. And while I start um at the point that I decide to start my treatment, I also think that it's the point I can tell my parents. So it's not. I think it's not very common for everybody to let parents know. But for me, because I have the kind of feeling, I I feel my parents will understand.、Um, this is actually just a disease, and they they will still love me as the way they do before. So I told them、uh, what I have done maybe in the past, and and so I actually got the diagnosis six months ago. But I decide to、uh, stop my treatment. So I would like you to go. I would like you both of you to go to the doctor with me. So doctor can explain more about what the treatment can work on me. And if you have other concern, you can also ask the doctor. So、um, so far, it's still working quite good for my my side because actually, if I don't have time to pick up pills in the pharmacy, my my mother will help me to do it. And some of the time, they will remind me, "Oh, do you have taken your have you taken your pills today?" So I'm kind of fortunate one. But I know a lot of people still struggle to、um, maybe not to disclose to their family or friends around them. Thanks very much. I think that just takes us on very nicely to talking about. Inadvertent disclosures for for both you and Joyce, and talking about the roles of healthcare professionals. And I felt that the film, you know, as a doctor, I felt that the film really made me think.、Um, you know, the, the the quotes of for some healthcare professionals, it's all about the science and obsession with compliance. They're judging your adherence and ignoring your experience. It's very troubling. Um, I wondered if you had advice for any healthcare professionals. Who are watching about you know what's really important in terms of care and in terms of trying to support adherence and how best to, best practice to do it. Who who would like to start? Sasha, would you like to come in? Oh yeah, I'm just smiling, Caroline, because you know what my adherence used to be like. <laughs> um, yeah, so I can. You know, now that I'm older and I look back to growing up and not taking treatment, because at first I didn't know what the treatment was for, and I was being forced to take all this medication that made me ill and sick. Which nowadays, obviously, treatment's so much more advanced; we don't have them side effects.、Um, I think one of the things that used to drive me crazy was you must take your tablets, you must take your medicine, you must, you must, you must. And I think for me. Um, obviously, I have a great support now. My partner is very good at helping me and he help me get on treatment and stay on treatment for this long. I've been on treatment now eight years solid,、um, which is a big achievement for me.、Um, but I think when I look back and everything that I've done now with peer supporting other other young people, and it's not so much about them not wanting to take them, and it's it, they don't take them because they don't believe the outcomes of them. And when I look back, if I would have known and was educated educated about HIV as much as I am today, and understood the virus and know the virus as much as I know myself, then I think I would have taken my treatment.、Um, but being very unaware, unknowing, living the unknown, I think I was scared. You know, I was in a bad place. I didn't deal with it very well. Taking my treatment was an easy suicide.、Uh, not taking my treatment was an easy suicide,、um, and it's, I didn't have to face reality. And for me, now I can face reality because now I don't care anymore. I'm happy, and I 
you know, I don't mind talking about HIV, but back then I didn't talk about HIV and, and HIV scared the living daylights out of me. And it scared me about the people I was around who knew about it. People had found out I was exposed very, very quickly when I found out I told somebody and it's got spread around my whole school that I had to leave education. And this response drove me even more to not want to take my treatment. I think the only thing that driven drove me to take treatment in my teens was when I got pregnant with my first child because I didn't want him to con to contract HIV. And I was told by yourself and other doctors that if I took my treatment, he wouldn't get it. And I took my treatment, he didn't get it. But as soon as I had him, I stopped taking my treatment because I still didn't understand myself and HIV together. Um, and then it took me obviously into getting sick and in and out of hospital. And then it took my partner that I've been with eight years to actually support me. He learned with me about HIV. We learned about it together more. We looked into it. He researched it and not only him researching, it helped him. It helped me too. And I'd get the odd quote from him. Did you know if you have a banana a day, it can help the immune system. And it's actually, you know, stuff like this, this helped. Whereas it was always very shut down everywhere else around me it was always like no one wanted to talk about it it was something you should be ashamed of it's something that you shouldn't talk about and I think talking about it and being open about it has definitely helped me and quite a lot of people I know I do understand that in other countries outside of the UK this is not the case and you cannot speak about it for your safety and this needs to stop yeah. We need to learn this, like Fletcher said, it's a disease and we should live with it as, a, as, as an illness, not as not as something that should be stigmatised as much as it is. Fletcher, do you want to add into that? Yeah, I actually want to echo the point that, um, so when we're talking about adherence, when I think um, people are not, pe as long as people are not forced to do it, and people are empowered and people have the knowledge about what what's the treatment works for them. I think everybody ac actually feel like very comfortable and willing to, to, to take the treatment. So for my case, uh, after I uh, found out my diagnosis then the nurse told me how the treatment works and how, uh, what kind of problem you may encounter, you, you can always um, discuss with the, the team. So actually I feel kind of like very kind support from my medical team. I think that that's one very important point. And also I think um, also the support from the surrounding as well. So after I got my diagnosis, I have got an opportunity to uh, join a training, uh, training group in uh, Asia Pacific region where I can meet a lot of young people living with HIV from different countries. And we go come together to learn about the science of HIV, how the treatment works, how the current research was. So while I was in that kind of, um, while I got that, that kind of empowerment, it actually keep myself very informed. So I, I would like to keep, um, keep my, adherence good and I also look out to other new treatments to come in the future and also uh, another point that I think is very important for young people is that in life growing up there's actually a, a line saying that take your meds and you will be undetectable sounds simple doesn't it and I, 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 I think the first line that take your mask and you will be undetectable is not really that easy. It's just not end. It's, it's actually lots of different daily life you happen in your day. So outside of the clinic, you have to, to go through a lot of difficulty in your daily life. So I think maybe one of the points that um, healthcare provider can I know a lot of healthcare providers are very busy, but one of the points maybe maybe helpful is that can understand what's behind the, the unwillingness that you are not willing to take the pills. If those difficulty can be solved, then I think the adherence would be the wouldn't be a problem. Fantastic. And I think that sort of education brings us on to another line in the movie is um, talking about you equals you. And there's a quote from the girl in the movie who goes, we don't need your pity, we just need you to be educated. Um, and Joyce, I was wondering how that resonates with you 
and your experiences? Yeah, I feel if um, awareness reach everyone, both positive and negative individuals, it will be much more better and much more easier. Yeah, and it reminds me of a, another quote, which was, there's no enigma in the stigma. People are stuck in the past. They're stuck back in the 1980s, the 1990s. And how do you think, any of you think, that we can change that, Sasha? People like us, speaking up, <laughs> shouting out about it. Um, on a daily basis, actually, I'm educating. I've just educated before I've come on this video um, with my carpet fitter, you know. <laughs> so it's not as easy, as I say, it's not as easy for everybody. Like I know for Joyce, it's probably extremely hard in Nigeria um, with how their their country runs with it. Um, I think in the UK, there is we have it a lot easier. However, we still have a hell of a lot of stigma. Um, and the stigma doesn't just lie with the word HIV. It lies with what people know from the past, that the, the way that they, when they think of HIV, they think of gay men, they think of drugs, they think of irresponsible sex. This is the tags that are behind HIV that need to be removed. Um, I will quote something that I was once done in National Testing Day. I was trying to encourage people to get tested. I had an Asian guy come up to me and said, oh, this, you know, HIV's come really far, um, but I won't get tested because I'm, I'm, I'm a straight man. I'm married. And I explained to him, he said, oh, I'm not gay. And I said, but I'm not gay. I'm a white English female and I was born with it. And his shock and horror that that could happen proves how... He had known that HIV had come far today, but he didn't know the education behind HIV. So we need to take the labels away. And how do we take the labels away? I don't know. But I speak up because being born with it and white English, it really does change people's perception um, because people either think, you know, as horrible as it is, it's either, as I said, a gay man's disease, a drug use disease, an irresponsible sex disease or an African disease. And I speak up to change these perceptions. Um, I think if we had more press coverage, like coronavirus came out, it's everywhere, it's all over the TV. We need to take them tombstones down and we need to take them labels away from it. Um, and I think if there is a lot more, maybe having it on more billboards, having it on more buses, having it in the more newspapers, having it on social media more, where it's going to hit a, a, an audience that wouldn't necessarily know about HIV. That's where we need to educate. And, and that video is a pure example how we can educate. Maybe we need something like that that educates HIV in a bit more detail for everybody. Fletcher. Um, so in, in terms of... Uh, U equals use um, functions on reducing stigma. I think that actually really helps because um, so from 2017, I think lots of international voices on U equals U campaign. And we also bring that kind of campaign into Taiwan. And while we are on some maybe education uh, occasion or uh, while we go out for parade or march, we will put out this kind of campaign. And we also do some survey on internet to um, like ask general population, uh, have you ever heard U equals U before? And after, um, if they answer no, and we will give them definition of what U equals U mean. And at the end, we will, answer, uh, we will ask the question. So have the message of U equals U reduce your fear about HIV? So actually like, nearly half of the participant of those survey that actually respond that uh, yes, the U equals U can, uh, message can reduce their fear uh, toward HIV. But um, I, I also want to flag another, maybe a little, not, not concern, a point that we have to be uh, careful about is that uh, although U equals U is a very important message, but there's are still people out there, maybe they 
are not able to get undetectable due to a lot of different reasons. Maybe they are lacking of ART, or they are just not um, in the good uh, setting that they can keep taking their medicine. So, as long as we are, uh, uh, although we're uh, advocating for a U equals U message, but we also advocating for the basic right for people living with HIV, no matter they, they, how their um, HIV viral low is. Fantastic. And and Joyce, what's your experience been of U equals U um, and the impact potentially on stigma? And, and how well do you feel that knowledge is out in the general public in your setting? Um, well, U equals U is, is, is actually like a shining light because um, it allows you to know that you can get married to anyone. It allows you can give birth to negative children. It also allows you not to feel you are any different from someone who is not positive. Um, I would say that I think it has done a lot of help in relation to stigma. Um, because um, some days back, I have a friend who uh, managed to disclose to his sister. He's been on drugs and his siblings don't know about it. Like he's, he's the only person who has been infected in the family aside from his parents. So um, it took him a lot of courage to um, bottle everything down and tell her. At first, um, her reaction, he said her reaction was that she was um, scared, she was panicking. She couldn't believe it because he didn't actually look um, all sick and all of that because I felt she was expecting um, to be able to read the HIV on his forehead, which mm-hmm. she didn't. Um, he had to give her some time, which he did, and he let her went back to her to explain and bottle down things to her. And this person I'm talking about has been exposed to um, trainings and seminars about people living with HIV is exposed to U equals U. So he was able to explain things to her and tell her that it is not the death sentence. He has been living with it and with his drugs, he's actually doing okay and all of that. And she was actually cool with it. And her first reaction was that she was actually going to to um, get him anything at all, whatever thing he should want, which mm-hmm. was actually nice. But he said he doesn't want that. He doesn't want that um, kind of like preference treatment. So, yeah, I feel you equals you is, is a shining star. Beautiful. Thank you. That's a fantastic um, reflection. I think that brings us on really nicely to the part where the young people were talking about relationships, the future, disclosing to partners. And I loved it when the girl said, I was encouraged by his curiosity and lack of animosity. He passed the test and I was determined to tell him. How does that resonate for you? Fletcher, would you like to... So um, uh, my my story with my my partner is actually pretty flat, but I have a, a friend of my a, a story of my friend. It's not actually my friend. So because I work in an organization, we actually got um, um, phone calls and counseling about um, uh, issues about HIV. So one day I got a call, and he is actually a, a, a not uh, he's not living with HIV. He, he called and. Uh, to ask about uh, the message about U equals U. And so uh, so the story goes like this. Uh, he asked about, can I ask you something about HIV? I, and I say, yeah, sure, de- definitely. And he said he was actually um, kind of depressed in the past three years. And there's a man and in the past uh, keep com- accompanying him and actually, uh, uh, um, so recently, the, uh, that that man actually told him that he likes him. He he likes him, so they are they are gay, and he wanted because. Uh, but by the time that the man uh, told him his love, 
he also tell him about uh, his HIV positive because he want this person to know before he make the decision, uh, are they going to be couple or not? So this man uh, call in to ask about the questions about equal, U equals U, is this actually uh, re really um, proved by the science? And I explained this to him and he said, after he listened to the explanation, he actually find re really relief because now he can feel very comfortable to go with this, uh, go with his partner and don't have to be afraid of HIV diagnosis or other things. So that actually, I think that that give a, a sample or maybe um, um, a hope to people that you're still able to be loved because I know some of the people after they got the diagnosis, they, they feel they are not able to be loved anymore in the future. But that, that's not the truth, that actually people will see what really inside you if, um, if they got educated about the information about HIV. Fantastic, thank you. And Sasha? Well, I know this is the truth, you equal you works. <laughs> so yeah, with, you know, relationships, it is difficult, even someone like me who's very open, um, it's still nerve wracking and I've had long-term relationships in the past and I've had short-term, had fun, and then I've had another long term and it never gets easier, uh, whoever you tell. And I think, yeah, I, I, having that support and having somebody that will listen to you and, and will work with you does make it easier and it is possible and they are out there. And I think it's just the way you equals you works with telling somebody is really powerful. We didn't have the word you equals you when I got with my current partner. Um, however, I knew you equal you existed, but it wasn't something that was very much spoken about eight years ago. Um, but explained to him that I'd already had a child that didn't have HIV. I'd already been in a long term partnership before where my partner hadn't contracted HIV. Um, helped me be able to talk to him about it. And actually, he was very chatty and open about it. So he did his own research and then he asked me questions and being able to provide the answers helped more with the U, U equals U message. And I think undetectable because untransmissible has changed a lot of people's lives and it's still changing. For me, I have used Twitter platform to help other people realise this, that, you know, I have three children that are undetectable, that don't have HIV because I'm undetectable. And I have a partner who doesn't have HIV because I'm undetectable. Um, and, and love is out there and relationships can work. We just need perceptions, change to change perceptions to, to support this with the U equals you message. And but then there is people out there that are still too scared to do that. So maybe then people are the ones that need help with the U equals you message. Because I still still now speak to people living with HIV that are undetectable, have been in long-term relationships, married even, that didn't know that they could have condomless sex to have children because they still believe they can pass it on even with the U equals U message. So it's one of the biggest things for me, I think, is that we need who on side, the World Health Organization, to display this U equals U message worldwide so that not just our country is, is getting it and Taiwan and, and Nigeria, but every country in the world has that evidence to support the governments, to support people living with HIV, to make this easier and yeah. to be able to disclose without fear. Yeah, I think that's very important. And it goes with obviously what um, Fletcher and Joyce were reflecting on earlier, which is having access to antiretroviral therapy. Um, yeah. Joyce, do you want to add something? Um, well, speaking from my experience, um, before I um, got to disclose to my partner, there was no U equals U. Like, I wasn't aware of that. I um, feel like if you have the right person, you um, have someone who is coming. Because I actually didn't know how to do 
go about with the whole disclosure thing. But I felt like, okay, um, I had to do this because when I got disclosed to, I had a lot of thoughts in my head. Um, thoughts like, are you really going to get married? Are you going to have children? Are you going to have a family? I was actually scared about that. And are you going to die? But um, with my doctor friend who um, disclosed to me, um, a lot of trainings and seminars that I attended as a peer mentor in my facility has actually opened my eyes. And I have seen that there is actually light in whatever disease I am suffering from. So um, when I started going out with this guy, I, um, I just decided that I needed to tell him, like I needed to let him know because he was um, someone who was sexually active. So I didn't want to go ahead with it without letting him know. So um, I summoned the courage and I, and I told him and he was um, kind of like shocked at first because he didn't believe it. He didn't believe that I was infected. I didn't look sick. I didn't look not okay. And he didn't actually know I was on drugs. So he was like, how? So I had to explain everything. And I had to tell him that I got it from my mom and explained things to him that um, I work at my facility where I assess my medication and this is this is this this is all about the virus this is um what you need to know if I am doing well then I feel you can't get infected and all of that and he took it in well um since then he's been supportive um most times if I do forget to take my drugs he's always there to call and remind me and ask me uh so he's been supportive and you equals you two has done a lot. Thank you very much for sharing. I mean, I think that brings us really to the, you know, that I would like to acknowledge the importance, what the three of you and other peer support workers do. And I was very struck by the sentence at the end of the film, which goes, I don't have to lie. I felt free. My confidence has grown. We are proud. Um, which I thought was an incredibly powerful statement um, to end the film. I don't want to quite end our discussions there because I think what a lot of young people ask me about is the concept of HIV cure and how important a goal is that. So I'd really appreciate your thoughts around that. Joyce, what what are your thoughts about science striving for a cure we've got to one pill once a day and you equals you what do you feel um yeah like i stated before i would actually love for that cure to come around because um for me as a person taking pills is not an easy thing for me like it took me a lot to get used to it because um when i started the whole journey I was, I was not, I was not taking my drugs. I wasn't. I was either trashing it or I would just affirm I took the drug, but I didn't. And it took time before um, my um, healthcare providers could um, get to know that she's not doing well. So um, I would really, really like it for the cure to peace of faith because I know that it, there are a lot of people out there who are like me. But I also have um, colleagues and peers too who actually think that um, the cure is nothing. They do need the cure because they feel they have a family with um, others who are positive. They feel like um, they are confident and it's, it's greatly grown since they joined um, the um, OTZ family. Um, OTZ meaning Operation Triple Zero, which is zero miss drugs, zero miss appointments, and zero miss, um, zero viral load. 
Um, he actually told me that um, he doesn't care about. Sorry. Sorry. Carry on. Okay. Um, he said that he doesn't care about the cure. He's he's found his cure in the family, the old Z family. So um, it's it's, it's kind of like a tie there. But for me personally, I really want the cure. Thank you very much. Now, Sasha. Oh, Caroline, as you've known me most of my life, you know that when I did actually find out and up till probably about four or five years ago, I always asked, can I be the first for the cure if it ever comes? I've always asked that. But that changed. That changed a few years back where I stopped caring about being positive and stopped reflecting on it affecting my life, basically. I changed my perception myself. And for me, I am the cure because I can't pass it on. My children don't have it. My partner doesn't have it. Um, I'm going to be getting married. I'm not going to be having any more children, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but Congratulations. The, the fact that I can't pass it on means that I will never be giving it to anybody. So that it's already stopped with me taking one pill a day compared to the 20,000 you used to give me as a child is nothing. Um, and it, yeah, I, I, I don't personally, I'm not bothered about a cure. If a cure came out, like Joyce was saying for certain people across the world, I think it would really benefit um, for the where they're living and, and they're, they're where they are. Um, but for me here in the UK, my life wouldn't change with or without the cure because, and I do want to reflect on what Joyce said, being HIV positive, I now have a huge family and I do love my HIV family. Fantastic. Thank you. And Fletcher, I'm going to leave the last words to you. Thank you. So I think uh, we have heard a lot from researchers that we actually trying to develop biological cure and that's maybe still have long run for it. But I think for the audience today or for people around us, I think we can have some of social cure. Like when we, people living with HIV are treated with dignity and, and when we are in power and we can be loved and we can love ourselves. I think that that's another kind that kind of a cure that we can give to ourselves and the, social and the society can build together like Sasha and Joyce just mentioned about we can have family we can have friends and when people see us as other people see um when people see us as the as they see other people I think that that's the time where cures can in and where a cure can be applied apply to everyone in the world thank you so much um thank you to all three of you for joining, for your incredibly insightful comments. Um, I'm sure our audience have found it absolutely fascinating and very educating at the same time. Take care, all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.